Roger Smith, Christopher Brown Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Penn Program on Democracy, Citizenship, and Constitutionalism. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening event of our seventh annual faculty workshop series devoted this year to the theme of citizenship and social rights. The Penn DCC program is generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, by the Mary and David Boys Family Fund, and uh, with we operate with the support of the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Amy Gutman, and the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Steve Fluarty. The theme this year takes as its occasion the fact that in the late 1940s, the great British sociologist T.H. Marshall gave a series of lectures published as Citizenship and Social Class in which he argued that as modern capitalist systems promoted economic inequalities, the values of equal citizenship created pressures for the establishment of social rights social rights to things like housing, education, employment or unemployment assistance, child care or old age pensions uh, or health care. And he believed that built in to the development of modern states was the elaboration of social rights to counterbalance the economic inequalities of capitalist systems generating economic growth but very differentially distributed. Well, in the early 20th, 21st century, uh, we're seeing plenty of economic inequality, but we're also seeing movements to reduce systems of social rights in various spheres. And so uh, we thought it was an appropriate time to reflect on the relationship of social rights and citizenship today. And we'll do that uh, through a uh, series of faculty workshops uh, listed on these cards, and you should pick up these cards so that you know about all our subsequent events, and the cards are located outside. A lot of you came in here and didn't see, but they're outside at a little table there, which also has a sign-up sheet uh, so that you can get announcements of our events. And so we urge you at the end of our discussion uh, to go out there uh, and to entice you, uh, we're having a reception with refreshments <laughs> at the end of this. So go out, um, uh, get the refreshments, um, get a card and the sign-up sheet, and you will see that this program uh, represents uh, an extraordinary array of fascinating speakers on different dimensions of the topic of citizenship and social rights. Uh, the uh, uh, program was put together by an interdisciplinary planning committee uh, with representatives uh, from the School of Nursing, the School of Social Policy and Planning, as well as uh, the departments of Sociology, History, Anthropology, and uh, Political Science. So uh, it represents the Penn effort to um, combine perspectives of different uh, disciplines on uh, issues of central importance, and none more important than the topic tonight, where we are focused on uh, health care as a social right. Uh, we meet at a time when, uh, in just a few days, the uh, Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, will go partly into effect. And it's striking that when Marshall gave his lectures, uh, Great Britain was just establishing the National Health Service. Harry Truman was trying to establish a National Health Service here. Uh, he failed. We did get Medicare and Medicaid as part of uh, great society developments, uh, but uh, the battle over whether or not to have uh, some kind of national health care system uh, continued, and although the Affordable Care Act is going into effect, we all know that the battle is far from ended. Uh, we are so divided over this topic that there is a chance that the whole government will shut down uh, <laughs> rather than uh, accept the implementation of the uh, Affordable Care Act. So 
the topic of health care as a social right uh, still a vital and bitterly uh, contested one. And uh, to uh, illuminate it tonight, we have a distinguished panel chaired by the chair of our planning committee for this year, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Julia Lynch in political science, who has written uh, extensively about social programs in uh, Western Europe as well, in Europe as well as the United States. And she will introduce you to our distinguished uh, panelists, Professor Lynch. Thank you all for coming today. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our three panelists. Um, this is a true dream team for an event of this nature. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce each panelist before he or she is about to speak. Um, each panelist has been allotted 12 minutes. <laughs> to share their accumulated wisdom. Um, Rogers will give a little sign uh, when there are two minutes remaining in your time. Um, and after we've made our way through all three presenters, we will have time for what I hope will be a really lively discussion. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, who is Jack Geiger, who I have to sit, start by just saying is a national treasure. All right. So who is this guy? <laughs> but you still only get 12 minutes. He's so embarrassed, but he still only gets 12 minutes. Right. Um, Jack Iger is the Arthur C. Logan Professor of Community Medicine Emeritus at the City University of New York Medical School. Um, he is probably most famous for having founded and directed the nation's first two community health centers in the Mississippi Delta and in Columbia Point, Boston, uh, which were both established in the second half of the 1960s. These centers emphasized acting on the social determinants of health and on participatory governance. They became models for what is now the national network of federally funded community health centers that serves 20 million low income and minority patients. Um, these federally funded community health centers are the closest thing we've got to a safety net in health and they're here in large part thanks to Dr. Geiger. Dr. Geiger also helped to found and was past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, which has addressed the health threats of nuclear proliferation, climate change, and environmental degradation, and Physicians for Human Rights, which harnesses the moral authority of physicians to speak out against torture, mass atrocities, and wartime rape. Dr. Geiger's work has inspired several generations of public health scholars and activists in the US and beyond, and we are absolutely thrilled to have him here with us today. Thank you. Let me sit here then. Uh, Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm very glad there's going to be a subtle signal because there are some podiums uh, where there's a flashing red light at uh, a minute before, and you figure that next there'll be a severe electric shock and then a trap door will open and you'll stop talking. Uh, this is a more humane uh, and civilized way to go. Uh, I, I, what's already been said by way of introduction, I think underscores the fact that this issue, uh, healthcare and healthcare as a right, has to be looked at uh, as it is every day today uh, with a much wider lens uh, because uh, it has been conflated with, it has really been subsumed in a much older, long-standing, back-and-forth American argument, I think, uh, uh, about, uh, it often gets put as the role of government, I put it a little differently, uh, about what constitutes uh, government assistance? Uh, is it uh, the, the slippery slope to utter dependency? It was crystallized in the last presidential election uh, with the statement that 47 percent of the public, that is anybody on any public assistance program in effect, uh, was just a taker, uh, a moocher, a shiftless uh, person that is, in effect, a drag on the society. Uh, 
that view conflicting with views of social rights, of the uh, real need for government assistance, uh, the idea, the legitimacy of the idea that the government, in fact, has a stake in the health of its population, and that this is one of uh, the key uh, ways to protect that. It is uh, equally clearly, as this argument almost always has been, uh, conflated with race and ethnicity, and we see all of uh, those moves in this society uh, being played out, that argument being played out right now with all of these, if anything, extreme <laughs> ramifications. Now, uh, if you've been around as long as I have, you get the chance to begin to recognize how cyclical uh, these swings are. About every 40 or 50 years, uh, the country and our national leaders, uh, one way or another, rediscover poverty. Uh, and then uh, for the next 30 years, they mostly talk about the market. Uh, and then uh, back comes a Michael Harrington or some other set of voices talking about what is in fact going on, uh, and poverty uh, becomes uh, an issue again. Uh, it is also clearly conflated with race and ethnicity, uh, and all of this is being played out now. One has to then speculate as to why this debate erupted with such intensity at this time. Uh, and why the attack is more broad-based, I think, than any that I can recall on this wide variety of uh, social assistance programs, uh, all looped under the word entitlement, which implies, uh, if it does not state uh, explicitly, a social right. And so, there are proposals to privatize medical care, to private, uh, to Medicare, to privatize Social Security, uh, to privatize uh, uh, other assistance forms, to peddle the myth uh, that, as uh, is being done with food stamps, uh, that there needs to be a work requirement uh, as if the provision of uh, nutritional assistance uh, to poor and lower middle income families is, <clears throat> is something that will uh, lead them not to work or to cease looking for work. Uh, and one can only speculate, uh, but I think this must be fueled in part, in addition to the traditional strains of uh, racism and an ideological belief in uh, small government and federalism, fueled by a perception of uh, the coming demographic shifts, the fact that whites are going to be a uh, population minority, not an economic minority, probably not a political minority in many senses for a long time, but nonetheless, for the first time, a minority. And I think underneath a fear of loss of white privilege uh, that spreads across all these attacks. And I, I say all of this, and I probably used up more than my first five minutes, because I think that's the context in which we have to talk about this. Uh, we need to remember some things in the ensuing discussion that aren't said often enough about health care, which is that having health insurance does not guarantee access to care for many people, both urban and rural. Uh, we did a study at the Columbia Point Pus housing project in Boston, uh, one of our first two health centers, four miles from one of the great collections of teaching in public hospitals on the East Coast in Boston. Uh, and it turned out, however, that that was two bus rides and more away uh, that people had to go to a general medical clinic, but then the clinic for their child's asthma met on another day. So we did a study of what was the mean, the average time round trip for 
somebody at Columbia to point to go to Boston and get medical care, uh, perhaps particularly uh, with a child. And door to door, it was six hours and, three, and four bus fares. And what did you do if you had two small children and no place uh, for them to be taken care of except to come along with you? And one can repeat that pattern in all kinds of other circumstances. The second thing that needs to be said by way of context is that uh, it's counterintuitive for people very often. Health care is and can be crucial for the individual, but it makes only a modest contribution to the health of a population. Uh, what contributes to the health of a population as well as affecting individuals and particularly in terms of whether they get sick or not uh, are what's already been referred to the social determinants of health uh, closely tied to income and poverty uh, to class structures and race in our society uh, and they are the things that have to do with whether people have enough to eat uh, whether they have anything like decent, affordable housing, whether they have clean water, whether they have dangerous or less dangerous jobs, whether they are exploited at work, uh, uh, whether they are facing eviction for this, that, or the other reason, uh, things that have been happening to the middle class, as you know, over uh, the last six or seven years. This is not just a poor people's set of issues. Those are uh, the determinants of health. And uh, on the biological sciences side, we have now tracked out what this kind of chronic, chronic stress uh, does to the individual. It resets, in simple, oversimplifying English, the fight or flight mechanisms so that people are pouring out stress hormones, cortisol and others, all the time. Uh, their pulses are racing, their blood pressure is up, and their organ systems start to weather and wear out at a rapid pace. Uh, there is a certain irony, there is a necessity, and all of us up here I know uh, agree on it, for people to have health care that, and in my own case, and I suspect many others here, uh, the belief that this is a fundamental governmental responsibility that indeed ought to be incorporated as a right, uh, as is done in most of the other industrial democracies, and sometimes with a brilliant mixture of public and private systems. Uh, that's the context to talk about health care and not talk about the social determinants of health and not talk about income inequality, and not talk about poverty, and not talk about all of these other stressors and inequities and inequalities, is to shortchange the discussion of a social right to health care. Uh, that state of health depends on many things other than health care. Health care should be a given and a beginning uh, and makes a profound difference to individuals and families. But if we say that it's a society, we care what happens to people. Let me close uh, just with one set of facts that I think is particularly troubling. Uh, the United States has led the developed world for the past decade or more in the percentage of children in poverty. We're way ahead of every other industrialized nation. Uh, in my city, it's every fourth child. Uh, in New York uh, lives in poverty. Uh, Stephen Wolf, a few years ago into the Great Recession, uh, wrote a paper to which I just contributed uh, a minor bit uh, about the startling rise with the beginning of the Great Recession in the percentage of children living in extreme poverty, that is living in uh, uh, at half or less of the federal poverty level. Uh, last October, I think it was, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences published an entire uh, supplement on new research uh, strongly indicating, it's in its early stages, 
that adversity in early childhood, uh, mostly defined as uh, living in poverty and all of uh, its environmental and social consequences, uh, is strongly associated with probably causes uh, uh, the development of different synaptic patterns, rewiring of the brain. The literal embodiment in children of the consequences of extreme poverty that we tolerate as a society. And we know that children living in poverty are going to have sicker, shorter lives, uh, die prematurely, and uh, have no shot at upward nobility. That, it seems to me, I think I'm getting subtle signals, uh, that, it seems to me... Next come electric shock. Yes, I, sure. That's the context uh, that I would hope we'll be talking about in this discussion. Great. Thank you so much. All right. I think on that happy note... <laughs> We'll go next to Dorothy Roberts. <laughs> you get even more depressed. <laughs> exactly, because I know Dorothy's always, always up for a, a good time. Um, <laughs> Professor Roberts uh, holds appointments in both the sociology department and the law school here at Penn as and a Africana professor. Studies. And Africana Studies. Um, she is the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. And I tell you, only Dorothy Roberts could do all of those things <laughs> at once. <It's> hard. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Roberts' work uh, focuses on contemporary issues in health, social justice, and bioethics, particularly as they impact the lives of women, children, and African Americans. And there is a lot of this work. Her most recent book, uh, on the implications of the new racial <coughs> genomics is Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, and I highly recommend it. Uh, before coming to Penn, Professor Roberts taught at Rutgers and at Northwestern Universities. She's also been active outside of academia, serving as chair of the board of directors of the Black Women's Health Imperative, on the standards working group of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which focuses on stem cell research, and on the advisory boards of the Center for Genetics and Society and the Family Defense Center. We are very pleased that Professor Roberts has joined the faculty here at Penn, and we are delighted that she could join us this evening. Thank you. Thanks. So, of course, Dr. Geiger said everything I was going to say. <laughs> and actually, our, our, the focus of what I wanted to say is very similar to his. Um, and so I, I think maybe what I will do is give some more examples of some of the points he was making about the, um, the relative, uh, I don't want to say unimportance, but less, lesser importance of access to health care, having health insurance, compared to the impact of gross social inequities in our society. And maybe I think I'm going to go a little bit further to say that Framing the social right as an access, a right to access to health care sometimes even obscures uh, more important barriers, more uh, powerful barriers to equal citizenship. Uh, so uh, I will start with some examples of uh, the uh, inequities, especially racial inequities I'm going to focus on, but I could make similar points about inequities in class and gender and, and disability as well. Uh, in uh, 2006, there was a study released in Chicago uh, that showed that white women and black women in Chicago get breast cancer at the same rate, but that black women are twice as likely to die from breast cancer. And that was a very startling finding. But just as startling was the finding that in 1980, black women and white women died at the same rate from breast cancer. What happened over the course of the next two decades was that white <coughs> women's rate was cut in half and black women's rate stayed the same. Their death rate stayed the same. Uh, the only explanation for that is that white women had access to the huge advances in uh, breast cancer detection and treatment that occurred over those two decades 
And the conclusion you have to reach is that what black women in Chicago got absolutely no benefit whatsoever from 20 years of advances in uh, care for breast cancer. Now, uh, this takes a horrible toll. What this means is that every year in Chicago, 111 black women die who would have survived if they had the same rate, survival rate as white women. You know, it's, like, it's literally people dying unnecessarily because of these racial gaps in health care. But as Dr. Geiger said, access to uh, health care services doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that there's going to be equal outcomes in health. Uh, and uh, the racial gap uh, co persists even when their people of color have equal access to health insurance. So it may, it may be reduced, but there still continues to be this gap. And it's typically because, not because minority patients don't have access to health care at all, it's because they have access to inferior care. Uh, they, so for example, uh, black heart attack victims rush to the emergency room are, wait the longest of any group to be treated and that causes higher rates of death from heart attack among black patients. Now what matters most is the hospital that they go to. Uh, if they go, they, then they tend to go to hospitals have the worst procedures. But it also, race also affects the care in the same hospital, even with the same insurance. Uh, black patients with heart, with heart attacks fare worse than anybody else, uh, even with the same health insurance. Um, and some of these differences are truly horrifying. I want to mention a study I read just on Monday that came out in advance in the October issue of Pediatrics that found that black children brought to the ER in severe abdominal pain receive significantly less pain relief than white children. I mean, it, you know, I've read these studies over and over, but that one, it just is horrifying. Uh, now, as Dr. Geiger was suggesting, even though providing equal access to high quality health care uh, is not enough to close the race and class divide in health equity because social injustice makes certain people sicker in the first place uh, before they get to the doctor's office or emergency room. So I just think personally, my equal access to health care doesn't really matter that much to me. You know, I have a pen insure, health insurance. I'm glad I have it, but I never want to use it. <laughs> I want to be healthy enough not to have to go to the doctor. And I am. I go just for yearly checkups. Why? Because I, I live a privileged life. That's what's important to me. Uh, but there are, of course, thousands and thousands of people in our society who don't have that benefit. And as, as Dr. Geiger was saying, social inequality has actual you know, measurable devastating effects on people's bodies. Uh, in their recent book, The Spirit Level, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pinkett present remarkably consistent evidence that health and social problems are more common in, uh, in, in, the, in countries with the biggest inequalities. Uh, that's what really matters the most, how equal a society is, even not just to how equal their health insurance <laughs> is, how much access there is to health insurance, but how, but the biggest income, in countries with the biggest income inequalities are the unhealthiest countries. So people in Japan, Sweden, and Norway live longer, are less obese, have fewer teenage births than people in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia because their societies are more equal. And there is a growing body of research showing the way in which racism is embodied that helps to explain. I mean, I think it's the best explanation for why we see these huge gaps along racial lines um, in, in health in the United States. Uh, racial inequities in income, housing, education, along with the experience of discrimination, you know, causes the stress that, uh, that can be um, linked to 
uh, and translate it into bad health. And there are now uh, more than 100 studies documenting the adverse effects of racial discrimination on health. Now, uh, think again about breast cancer. Last month, a study was reported in JAMA that found that differences in treatment for breast cancer accounted for less than 1% of the 13% difference in survival among black and white breast cancer patients all receiving Medicare. Uh, the, they couldn't attribute the, the, the gap in survival uh, largely to differences in treatment. It had to do with differences in the health of women when they get breast cancer. That, that is a, a big part of it. So women whose health is already in a poor state uh, are not going to do as well regardless of whether they have insurance. Uh, over and over again in my research and advocacy on the reproductive health of black and Latina women, I found that the right to health care was not only inadequate, but sometimes could misdirect policy if these deeper inequities of race, gender, class, and disability weren't attended to. So uh, take, for example, uh, the issue of access to reproduction assisting technologies, or ARTs. Uh, black women are less likely to use ARTs, even though they actually have higher rates of infertility than white women, despite the stereotypes about black women being overly fertile. But uh, even when they are able to use ARTs, they are much less likely to uh, give birth to a live baby. So they have lower birth rates uh, than white women, even when they have access to these technologies. And I think the explanation is that uh, again, their overall health is worse to begin with, after, you know, but before they use uh, reproduction assisting technologies, the way that racism has already damaged their bodies makes it less likely that these technologies are going to produce what uh, they're designed to produce. Uh, also, rather than equalizing access to ARTs, it would be more effective to address the higher rates of infertility among black women by improving basic conditions that lead to infertility in the first place, like occupational environmental hazards that they're more likely to uh, encounter. Also, black and Latino women are disproportionately forced to delay childbearing uh, by long prison sentences that keep them behind bars during their most fertile years. Uh, so, you know, incarceration uh, needs to be addressed in order to deal with this issue of infertility. Um, expanding access to high-tech fertility preservation then can take the place of dealing with structural inequalities that harm women's reproductive health and is much more likely to benefit middle-class, you know, privileged women than uh, uh, women who are actually suffering from higher rates of infertility. In June 2005, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first pharmaceutical indicated for a specific race. Uh, Bidil is a, a combination drug that relaxes the blood vessels, and it was authorized to treat heart failure uh, specifically in black uh, heart failure patients. Supporters of Bidil countered criticism of this racial label by arguing that giving blacks access to race-specific medicine was important to advancing their health. Uh, here, Bidel was portrayed as a solution to racial gaps in heart disease, implying that the gaps stem from flaws inside black people's bodies rather than flaws in the society uh, in which they live. And I think this is an example of the way in which equal access to health care, although it is a social right, I, you know, I firmly believe that there should be no question that every member of our society should have a right to good quality guaranteed health care paid by the government. I absolutely believe that. But focusing on access can mask how commercial interests to push pharmaceutical, insurance, and biotech products uh, is, is seen as a cure for the deeper inequalities that are really what is causing unequal health in our society. And 
Uh, I think we need to be wary of an expanding notion of biocitizenship that looks at, to, to tie into the theme of citizenship and democracy, that looks at citizenship as you know, being consumers of pharmaceutical and biotech products to manage our health at the individual level, even at the genetic level, as opposed to a collective form of citizenship that isn't, isn't about purchasing products, you know, gaining greater access to products, but is about uh, working together to end the inequities that cause poor health uh, and that uh, promote a more humane world where children are not denied pain treatment uh, when they come to a hospital in severe abdominal pain. So thank you. I told you. <laughs> yeah, that's. A, I mean, it's such a scary image. It's so yeah. troubling to me. Oops. Yeah. All right. Our last speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Goldhagen, who is the Neviaser. Is that right? Something like that. Family South, professor yeah. in pediatric palliative care in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. Um, Dr. Goldhagen's clinical and research interests are in the areas of public health and maternal and child health, children's rights, and child advocacy. Dr. Goldhagen worked as a clinician in Cambodian refugee camps in Thailand in the early 1980s, was on the faculty of the Gondar College of Medical Sciences in Ethiopia in the late 1980s, and was among the first physicians to raise the alarm about the condition of children in Romanian orphanages after the fall of the Ceausescu regime in the early 1990s. He also, and perhaps more mundanely, served as medical director for the city of Cleveland while on the faculty at Case Western Reserve University Medical School, and went on to become director of the Duval County, Florida Health Department for 12 years. He has been a tireless advocate for the health rights of children and we are very pleased that he could join us this evening. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's, I feel a little bit like the proverbial duck out of water. I mean, I'm a pediatrician. I take care of diarrhea and kids vomiting all day long. But, uh, uh, but it really That's what I do, too. Really? <laughs> Except I get paid for it. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> Actually, I, they voted me off the island. I don't do that anymore. But, um, uh, but the issues that um, we've heard about today are the critical issues that we're dealing with in medicine. And uh, the epidemiology that we've heard about is sort of framed in the context of social epidemiology. And since Michael Marmot did uh, his initial studies in Whitehall uh, in the 60s, starting in the 60s, we've known about this social epidemiology. And there have been accumulation and of more and more and more and more depressing data that continues to be ignored here in the United States. Um, and as was suggested, we didn't start off at the bottom. We started off never really at the top, have, but have worked our way to the bottom as other countries have, in the developed world in particular, have understood these critical issues. So my my, uh, my focus over the last 10 years, 15 years or so, is to ask the question, what do we do about it? I mean, what do we do about it? We've heard about health disparities, and you know that's just an epidemiological term. It says that there's a difference between two groups. Um, and the kind, of, the kind of statistics that we're hearing are, are of critical, critical importance. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out what to do about it. And the, the consensus here uh, is that health care is almost irrelevant to the health to health outcomes. Almost. It represents about 10 to 15 percent uh, to, to health outcomes. And in particular, in adults, it almost, it, that's e it's even less than that. So we have this tremendous amount of social epidemiology, which uh, up until 10 years ago we could talk about and in scientific uh, environments and people would say, well, explain it. And as Dr. Geiger suggested, now over the last 10 years, we can explain it, down to the methylation of the gene. Um, we can tell you why the social epidemiology happens. Great. So now what do we do about it? 
And so the answer to that question uh, really is, um, in my mind, uh, focused on human rights. Um, and what we'll talk about here over the next uh, 10 minutes or so is, is how to frame that. Obviously, um, we can't do it in, in 10 minutes, but to at least begin the dialogue and discussion. And I, am I the only one in the room that's read this? Uh, uh, I did read this, actually, uh, through uh, Dr. Marshall's uh, uh, treatise here, and it was amazing to me how insightful he was. So what I want to do is really give you 10 or 11 points to, to we can use to start the discussion. First is, is that there's an evolution of rights. So in, doc, in Marshall's essay, he talks about civil rights in the 1700s, political rights in the 1800s, social rights in the 1900s, um, and from the year 1950 on or 1940 on, now we have to talk about human rights. And since the, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child came into force in 89, now we have to talk about child rights. And there's a reason why child rights is extremely important for everything that comes down the line, because by the time you are born, by the time you are born, essentially, essentially your long-term health outcomes are defined at that point. Um, and so children's rights really make a difference. Second point is that we can't talk about social rights, civil rights, political rights, because one of the critical principles of rights is that they're holistic and that you can't separate them. Um, so that when we talk about rights, we have to talk about them holistically uh, and can't, really can't talk about social rights if, in fact, we're concerned about outcomes. The third point is that, that there's a difference between rights and the capacity to fulfill those rights. There's a difference between conferral of rights and realization of rights. And if what we're focused on, if what we're all about is not giving rights or conferring rights, but realizing rights, that's a different story, as we've heard. We can give you the right to health care. We can't give you the right to health outcomes by conferring just the right to health care. And that's of critical, critical importance. So that conferring rights is actually not synonymous with realizing rights. The next is the issue of equity. So we talk about rights. But I'm going to suggest that we can't talk about rights without talking about equity, um, and that we need to move from a focus on equality to a focus on equity, and that rights are just part of the equation that has to include the concept and principles of equity uh, if we're dealing with any issues that we want to actually realize outcomes. And when we start talk talking about equity, we then start talking about the distribution of resources and the distribution of power, right? And then we start talking about that distribution, then we talk about social justice, which really is about how we distribute finite resources. So that, so that there's an evolution to this. And when Marshall started talking again about civil rights and political rights and social rights, and then human rights and now child rights, we also then have to begin to include in that dialogue and discussion, if we're interested in the realization of rights, issues and principles of equity and social justice. And um, now, having said that, those issues of equity and social justice and rights don't exist in a vacuum, right? They don't exist in a vacuum. And that really is probably the most important part of this dialogue and discussion that we've already started talking about, is that they're informed, in our case, by science, right? We know that, in fact, conferring the right of a person for access to health care doesn't mean that they are realizing the right to health, right? Conferring the right to a host of, of, of social and civil and political uh, opportunities doesn't, re doesn't mean that you, uh, that you can realize those rights unless you understand the science that we now know about as social epidemiology and uh, as well as the life course sciences, which is the physiology behind those. And so that we now expand the sphere that we need to work in if, in fact, we're interested in realizing rights. 
If we want to confer rights, we can confer rights, right? Um, but if we want to realize those rights, we need to talk in terms of social justice, we need to talk in terms of equity, and there needs to be a science behind that. In my realm, that science is the medical sciences, physiology, and so on. To an economist, the science is a different science, right? To an educator, the science is a different science. But, and Marshall has this fantastic um, quote, which I'm not going to be able to find, but basically says if, 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 if society is interested in educating and an educated workforce, basically, he said, it is, means more than just giving them the right to go to school, right? And so, so reg regardless of where your area is, then these terms of, of rights and social justice and equity need to be informed by the science in which the area that you're working in. Um, now, like anything, like whether you're in medicine or education or psychology or economics, uh, you, you know, there's a saying, a, a man's only as good as his tools, right? You go out to fix a light bulb and you don't have any tools, you can't fix it. Um, so we're, we need a new tool set. So the tool set that we've had to work with in the context of medicine and medical science, in which we teach our medical students and residents, and I can tell you, I can tell you that I see um, every medical student that rotates through our, 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 or our community and every pediatric resident that comes through, and they have never heard the issues that you're talking about. They don't know anything about social epidemiology. They don't know anything about the life course sciences. Now, if you're a conspiracy theorist like me, it's because there's a lot to lose if the medical profession and the hospitals or the medical industrial complex understands, right, it has to respond to the fact that we're spending two and a half trillion dollars doing their work and it re really constitutes 10% to health outcomes. Um, so we need a whole new set of tools in order to implement the, and translate these principles of rights and social justice and health equity actually into practice. And that's the challenge we have right now, and there are a number of folks around the world uh, that are working on developing those tools, developing those indicators, changing the framework of medical ethics and bioethics to include human rights and social justice. And so that's happening at this point. So if you, if you come back to sort of the, the beginning of this discussion as it relates to, or at least the title, as it relates to citizenship, I would suggest that, in fact, that, that access to health care is a critical issue, uh, of course. Uh, but if we're talking about citizenship, citizenship isn't defined, in a sense, by or required to be defined by access to health care. Citizenship is a reflection of the holistic realization of rights, none of which can you segment out. And finally, um, the two other issues that we won't talk about is that there is a critical balance between individual and collective rights um, and that really ultimately what we're talking about is the distribution, uh, distribution of rights. And in, in my environment where I work uh, in the area of rights, it's almost, it's almost uh, nonsensical to talk about rights and citizenship or social rights and citizenship. Um, by definition, every child by virtue of the fact that they're imbued with, with human rights, as defined by the Convention of the Rights of the Child, are by definition citizens. Well, We call this round table a round table on health care as a social right. And part of the reason that that happened is because I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and in my own work, I tend to distinguish very clearly, or I attempt to distinguish very clearly between health as a social right mm -hmm. and health care as a social mm -hmm. right. And so one of the things that I asked the panelists to do via email was to consider how important healthcare per se was as a social right, 
and I think we have consensus here that it's <laughs> important but not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I asked them then to consider a couple of follow-ons to that. Um, first, what social rights, aside from a right to health care, would need to be in place in order to ensure equity in health? Mm -hmm. And they've mentioned a number of them. Professor Geiger men mentioned transportation mm -hmm. as a key. We've heard a lot of other ones. Um, I'd like to put to each panelist um, the question, if, if you could only pick, <laughs> <laughs> if you could pick three things. Oh, do we get three? You get three. Yeah, that's a little better. <laughs> if you could pick three things um, <clears throat> to work on uh, to grant as a social right that would actually improve health and would lead to health being a right of citizenship, what would those three things be? And what would be necessary politically to get there? Who wants to start? <laughs> I don't want to go first well, all the time. Uh, well, that um, <laughs> you know, f first, that requires my taking what I think would need to be done and put it in a language of rights. Mm -hmm. So much of what I was talking about is very deeply embedded um, institutionalized, systemic, you know, I was focusing on racism, but I could also talk about uh, uh, inequities in wealth that are, you know, deeply embedded in U.S. institutions, yeah. of gender, of uh, ability. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have time to talk about uh, the way in which discrimination and devaluing of people with disabilities affects all of these issues as well. So, um, you know, could I say there is a right, you know, even the right against discrimination doesn't get at it, which, so I think part of the, part of the, um, you know, so uh, to, to, this is really a friendly critique of the title. It really is not a criticism. But one is not just health care versus health, the other is right, and whether rights can uh, capture the kind of radical upheaval in the unequal and unjust institutions that cause poor health um, at all. So maybe I'm, the, the, with that preface, I well, will leave it me, to the others to well, talk about. Well, let me pick about, up, well, let me yeah. pick up yeah. where you are. So, um, so I like to play this <coughs> game uh, with groups and um, it's a game called Guess What I'm Thinking. Um, and so why don't, we, why don't we play that? We'll start off. So if I say the word civil, what do you say? Unrest. Right? <laughs> Disorder. Okay. All right. Score one for you. Whatever that. Um, and if I say the word voting, what do you say? Right. And if I say the word women's, and if I say the word gay, and if I say the word animal, or I say the word tenant, every, every social movement that we hold sort of dear to us didn't happen, right, unless we put and framed it in the context of a rights-based framework. Mm -hmm. so, so we have a pedigree and a tradition of rights in this country. But if I said children, you wouldn't say rights. And so the context that if you could do one thing, two things actually, would be to change that context, to be able to say and have moved to an environment where when you say children or child, that fundamentally the response is, is rights. Um, and now you, we also don't talk in terms of human rights e either. We talk really about these specific areas, but we don't really talk in terms of our politics and social movements about a movement of human rights. But in particular, we don't use the term in context of children's rights. The second thing I would do, which is related, is, is use the parlance of rights. So uh, this issue comes up all the time. 
in, in, in the United States when people will say, well, if you want to accomplish this, you can't talk in terms of rights. You've got to change it. You've got to subjugate it. Um, but my perspective is and until we start talking about rights and until we move to an understanding that it's a holistic context and construct of rights and not a social right or, or a civil right or an economic right or a cultural right, uh, that we can't talk about one thing or three things. We have to talk in the case of you know, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, we have to talk about 41 articles that actually define the requirements the, of, of, of the distribution of rights that are required in order to affect, which is one of the core principles of children's rights, which is Article, article 6, uh, optimal survival and development. So we've got to move away from siloing it, use the parlance, and understand if we're going to affect these outcomes that we have to frame it in the context of rights. That's the, actually one idea distributed into three parts. <laughs> uh, if I had to pick one to start with, uh, I would put first on the list uh, the elimination of gross inequality of income because it leads in turn to so many uh, of the other social and environmental problems that we've been talking about that contribute so heavily uh, to inequities in health status. Uh, and uh, the second uh, would be, I think, we have to, um, this is not going to be an orderly list, we have to find a way uh, to resolve the conflict that I think is so powerful in this country, periodically at least, uh, between all of the things that Dr. Goligan has been talking about and this idea of uh, it all depends on individual responsibility and individual initiative and uh, uh, what do we mean uh, by rights? Uh, you make your own future. Uh, that's a long-standing uh, kind of idea uh, that has contributed to so-called American exceptionalism, although I don't think it's limited to us. And we are once again going to have to join that. It conflicts with other very strong American traditions of community and cooperation <coughs> and neighborliness, but those are not the same things as rights. Uh, and uh, we are locked in that. Uh, when we talk about the political formation and pathways to get some of this accomplished, uh, I think we're in a cul-de-sac that's going to be difficult uh, to find a way out of. Uh, <coughs> With help from the Supreme Court, the Congress has been tur turned into a kind of a marketplace. Uh, we all uh, know how uh, the lobbying and campaign fundraising and legislative processes uh, tend to work, and they are very much built into the system right now, and they are being intensified by systematic disfranchisement of many of the elements, not just limited to race and ethnicity, uh, in the population that are most likely to protest against this and find a way out. I think next on my list, there needs to be, and Jeff in a way has, has uh, touched on it in terms of health outcomes and population health status and what determines uh, uh, those two things, those, those same things. Uh, we need to somehow intensively broaden the understanding, both for children and adults, of uh, this distinction uh, between health care and seeing the doctor and being at the hospital or the community health center or whatever and what it does, uh, 
and understanding that the way we structure the society is and our political and social decisions are what really are the determinants of health. Let me tell an iconic story about that understanding. It's become iconic. When we were, uh, had just got started in Mississippi in the second poorest county, uh, Bolivar County, and we were trying to provide care for about 14,000 black people, uh, mostly sharecroppers displaced by mechanization of cotton agriculture. One double row cotton picker replaced about 100 people. Uh, and with an annual family income of, uh, in 1966 dollars, 67 dollars, of about $600 a year uh, per family. And we kept seeing children with infectious diarrhea and dehydration who were also severely malnourished. And those things just uh, are synergistic and make each other worse. And they had infectious diarrhea because there were no water systems and they were drinking water from the drainage ditch or sometimes collecting it in barrels from rainwater, only they happened to be old pesticide barrels. Uh, and uh, they were malnourished because people were shooting squirrels and trying to gather pecan nuts uh, to feed their kids because uh, food stamps were just beginning and they cost money. And uh, uh, commodity surplus had stopped. So whenever we got tired <coughs> of that, so whenever we saw a family in this kind of crisis, uh, we started writing prescriptions for food. So much meat, so much milk, so much fruit, so much vegetables. Enough for all the kids in the family because we understood that no mom and pop were going to feed just one child uh, while the others went hungry. And we worked on an arrangement uh, where the family could take uh, these prescriptions to any of about a dozen black grocery stores in our 500 square mile target area and filled them at the grocery store. They usually last about two weeks and we called it a loan, although we knew people didn't have the capacity likely to repay just to preserve dignity. Uh, they filled it at the grocery store and the grocery store sent the bills to the health center and we paid for it out of the pharmacy budget. And it worked just fine. And so they stopped gap and temporary measure. We later invented something better. But the governor of Mississippi heard about it and uh, decided that his worst fears were realized and that Soviet communism had come to the Delta. Uh, and he, in turn, yelled at our federal funders, the poverty program, and they uh, sent somebody down who yelled at me, uh, saying, what in God's name did I think we were doing, in effect, giving away free food and charging it to the pharmacy budget and I said, what was wrong with that? And he said, a pharmacy in the health center is for drugs for the treatment of disease. And I said, the last time I looked in the medical book, the most specific therapy for malnutrition was food. And he went away because there was no answer to that. Uh, and it is precisely the distinction between healthcare and its components and what the society makes possible for individuals and segments within it that is what we got to be continue to be concerned about. I think we better open it up because I see Mary Summers in the <laughs> front row who <laughs> just can't contain herself. <laughs> well, so my most immediate kind of practical question is there any incentives under the Affordable Care Act to, that, that, can, that we can use to encourage health care institutions to start? diagnosing and treating food insecurity in the way that you did in Mississippi? Well, there are palliative attempts, at least. Uh, uh, Dr. Gullick and I were talking about two of them earlier. Health Leads, which uh, uses the research skills of college students attached to community health centers and now uh, other clinical facilities. Uh, uh, when families are discovered to have food insecurity or a whole range of 
other stressful, troubling problems facing eviction, uh, domestic violence or disputes, exploitation at the workplace, you name it. Uh, they are, students are very skilled, college students at research skills at finding the food banks, the resources, the whatever. Uh, in the same vein, but at another level, uh, there is uh, uh, an organization called Medical Legal Partnerships that in effect puts pro bono lawyers as part of uh, the clinical team uh, and has a whole, has developed a whole screening tool for just these kinds of uh, real world uh, social problems, if you will, or social in their origins. Uh, and uh, to, make it, to take uh, one example, you've got a disabled kid at home and uh, you're broke and you can't pay the utility bill and the utility company is about to turn off uh, all the electricity. And the, neither the family nor the physicians knew that in most places, uh, there's a law that says you can't do that if there's a disabled kid at home, but the lawyer knew. And uh, what happens when you put these palliative resources together with clinical teams is the clinical teams get sensitized. And they start thinking about this problem. We were putting it as they get a different view of where does it hurt or why does it hurt uh, that's broader than uh, the merely uh, biomedical. And good doctors, in point of fact, have always done that. Uh, but those changes, those advances are palliative rather than structural. Uh, and it is structural change of the kind that all three of us have talked about, income inequality, uh, r racial segregation, and the consequences that go with that, uh, uh, racism uh, within the health professions, mostly unconscious, but just as insidious uh, nevertheless, uh, that requires institutional commitments in undergraduate and graduate medical training uh, institutions to change the nature of training, and some of that's starting to happen. Uh, but a, uh, nobody has used this uh, famous conservative phrase so far, but I'll borrow it, uh, with rights go responsibilities, and in my view, the responsibilities that all of us have is to be working for these kinds of structural change. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to happen. Uh, and that is really not just a political solution or political activity, it sounds like it, but it is also a community and a social activity uh, that uh, we can conduct in uh, multiple aspects of our lives and through some of the kinds of organizations uh, that have already been mentioned. Uh, we need a new civil rights movement, if you like. Uh, I've had enough of the 50-year celebrations. Uh, <laughs> and we have this urgent attack going on now uh, that we have all in one way or another been describing. Uh, we need to go to the organizations that we're part of or to form new ones if we need to, uh, to be on the other side of those same issues. And uh, as Dr. Goldhagen has talked about, to start talking about rights, which is just what SNCC and COFO and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was doing uh, all through the 1960s. Uh, and for one last point, since uh, the essay by Marshall uh, was mentioned. In fact, this understanding has been around for a very long time. Uh, epidemiologists like to talk about uh, Rudolf Virchow, Virchow in 1948 and John Simon, the first officer of London. But there is a paper that public health students get to read by Johann Peter Frank, written in 1790, <laughs> that says it all. It is entitled, uh, uh, the people's misery, the mother of all disease. That pretty well sums it up. There, is, there, there are a few things, um, but, but probably the most powerful one is the negative incentive, and that is the negative incentive for readmission, in particular related to Medicare. Uh, 
So if a patient uh, is discharged and has to be readmitted, then the hospital doesn't get any reimbursement for that readmission. And, and so there are, there are lots of little pieces hidden in that, but to me that's probably the most nuanced one. Anything for kids? Anything for kids? Yeah. Even for kids, I think. No, well, no, I, I understand there's that incentive for adult care and readmission. Is well, there, there are some, there? there are some, yeah. So for kids, what we've done is actually we've cut the uh, food stamp budget by $40 billion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. So that's, well, that's, 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 that's what we've done for kids. Um, there are a few things for, for children, um, and some of that, for instance, which is, you know, actually just talked about this, this, we have a breastfeeding coalition that's trying to get all of our hospitals to be baby friendly. So there are new JCO uh, requirements under, in, in, in part, uh, catalyzed by the uh, ACA uh, for breastfeeding rates. Um, and so on, on the surface, then the hospitals are going to be, um, going to be judged based on that. Uh, but the way, but the formula industry lobbied it so hard that the, the denominator now is um, what the mother wants to do when she walks in without having any. So if she says she wants to bottle feed, then, and 100% of kids bottle feed, in the, um, then they have 100% breastfeeding rate, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> So, 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 so there's really not a lot for, you know, so expanding to age 26 for kids, if you believe that in fact health care makes a difference. Uh, so, it, you know, so the, this issue is that this is a health insurance law. It's a law that expands health insurance um, that has some other things uh, uh, like uh, uh, electronic medical records, which have never really shown to be of any great um, importance, really. But so it's really a health insurance law. But but the irony of, of Dr. Geiger's story in light of cutting food stamps by forty billion dollars, I think is really probably we might as well we can go home now, really, because it really reflects where we've come. Yeah. And um, so it was depressing. <laughs> now it's really <laughs> Depressed. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> I'd actually like to ask a follow up question about the ACA as an insurance law as it relates to health equity. And so um, I think to do something about equity, you need political clout, right? And one community that has a lot of clout and even a stake in equity, we might say, is the insurance community. Um, and I, you know, historically, this is a fragmented industry, hugely competitive. But I'm, curi profitable. <laughs> I'm curious if now with the ACA, um, with a move towards more universal insurance, um, if you see any role for the insurance industry in promoting health equity. And I know it's complicated. I know that not everyone's participating in the exchanges and so on. But I'm curious to know if you see any sort of changes in, um, in what that, that group might be, might be interested in. And health, what do you mean by health equity? Do you mean that insurance companies might promote greater um, access to health care by, you know, people of different races, socioeconomic backgrounds, abilities, or is it, um, it are, or do you think there might be a way that insurance companies would actually get to these deeper issues that we've been talking about of, um, you know, so I'm referring more systemic change. I'm referring to health status because insurance companies really need or prefer to have uh, risk well distributed in their right, in right. their pay, in their in their policyholders. Right. Um, and so I'm referring to health status. Mm -hmm. It's really in their interest to have equitable health status across uh, policyholders. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know if now that they, um, now that the insurance industry is changing because mm -hmm. of the law, if you expect them to have any kind of different, if you're, you expect their role to be a little bit different in health equity mm -hmm. debates. Oh, I think they'll game the system, okay. uh, yes. which is what uh, the profit motive almost always uh, 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 pushes one to do. What I've read about uh, 
this is only what I can read in the newspapers about a lot of the early proposals, uh, is that they are uh, excluding lots of uh, hospitals, uh, community health centers, and others from their networks. Uh, in California, for example, the entire hospital system of the University of California is ruled out of the networks of uh, uh, most of the insurance company offerings. And uh, you, you get charged an arm and a leg if you go out of network. Uh, and there are calculations of cost and profitability, presumably, that go into that. Uh, we're going to have to keep <coughs> pushing and fighting on that kind of level. But we really need uh, to start thinking and talking about uh, new institutional forms. Uh, and never mind the dreaded word socialism. If you look at mixed public-private systems like Switzerland or the Netherlands or Austria, they have, this is hard to fathom, they have insurance companies, health insurance companies, that by law are required to be nonprofit. Imagine that. They compete on service. They are part of a mixed government private system, but the whole driving mechanisms are something different. It goes with the embodiment of a right in terms of health care in realistic terms rather than merely access. These are societies in which health care is a right. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have their own class and racial stratifications. Uh, they do. But their health equity, their health status gaps are, by and large, not nearly as severe as our own. And so maybe there are other pathways. We have a lot of questions in the audience, oh. and we have very little time left. So if I can convince the panelists to take a few more questions, I think that would be great. Sure. Let me just comment. So you, just, you need to be really careful. The insurance industry has no interest whatsoever in health status. <laughs> right. So your premise is wrong. Right. They are profit driven. And I would ask you to do a wonderful experiment. Go tonight or tomorrow to Google Image and Google Blue Cross headquarters. And every state has a nonprofit Blue Cross head, head pro program. Look at their headquarters. Look at their headquarters. And then look at what the, and it's harder to get what their executives make. Yeah. They are making billions and billions and billions of excess, pro, of excess revenue over expenses. There is nothing nonprofit about the nonprofits. <laughs> and there's no interest at all in health status. Your choice, Matt. Oh. <laughs> What about fundamental differences in the health care as a consumer? And I can have a, a group of patients from an, a, a, an affluent area, and they may take their medicines and come to the appointment. And I can have the same patient from a, uh, an inner city area that has good insurance, that has access to the top hospitals, but may not show up for appointments, may not take their medicine. And how much do individual how much does individual responsibility play a role? And do we have fundamental problems that we can't solve? Well, I think that Dr. Geiger, you know, gave a great example of one of the reasons why there's this so-called lack of compliance. It has to do with structural reasons why people in certain communities have difficulty even getting to health care uh, facilities, even if they have insurance. Largely, it's inconvenient. Uh, or they have to wait for lots and lots of hours and maybe missing work, maybe have to get back to children. I, I think that before we start blaming individuals for being noncompliant, as if there's something about people in certain communities that they don't want to take advantage of health care that's available to them, it would be much more logical to look and you know there's more evidence of it to look at what is preventing them from being able to have true access and i in my own experience when i have worked with people who may be labeled as you know not not being compliant not really wanting drug treatment you know 
I found, and there are lots of you know, other studies of other people to back this up, that there are impediments to their being able to take full advantage of what might, what might be available to them, plus that what is available is often inferior. And that's why uh, they may not be as uh, eager to take advantage, uh, because it's just not the same quality of health care that somebody in a wealthier, more privileged community uh, is able to, to access. I mean, that, that's my experience and the evidence I've seen. And in, it's, in addition, uh, there's a, such a ton of literature about uh, the communication difficulties be, between physician and patient yeah. that also contribute to this. Uh, there was a study long ago, I'm sure it's gotten somewhat better than this, in which somebody had the bright idea of interviewing everybody that came out of the outpatient department, the general medical clinic at Cornell, I think it was, and 50% of them didn't know what their diagnosis was. Uh, medical schools are teaching more about uh, uh, communication uh, and adherence is least uh, probably uh, by social class as well as by race, and it's because physicians are very often talking to low-income patients across a communication class barrier, mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't know what's going on, you're less likely to come back, mm -hmm. aside from all the practical mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. And there's more of this built into medical education or residency training than there used to be, but not enough. We have a question way in the back. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I have a question. Um, do you think the setup of the Affordable Care Act as it is right now will help to improve disparities in health literacy among ethnic populations? Because I know that um, decreased health literacy, especially in like African American populations, is a huge reason why they might not be able to be compliant with their medications or even um, increases their rates of being readmitted to the hospital. I think there's a misperception about the Accountable Care Act um, in the sense that it's, it, this is fundamentally uh, an expansion of health insurance. Yeah. Um, it, it's a health insurance expansion. There is really, you know, there, are some, there are some efforts in it, um, for instance, the, the, the panacea of the electronic medical record um, to push the electronic medical record as if it's going to improve patient outcomes. Um, and there's not a lot of data related to that. The amount of the, the necessity of using the electronic medical record, which actually takes more time to use, actually decreases uh, personal, interpersonal um, communication and has an impact on health literacy that Dr. Dr. Geiger was talking about. So, um, from you know, so to a certain extent, it's a gross generalization, but there really is really very little on the ACA that is focused on improving outcomes by dealing with root causes, um, and so that's the fallacy of the uh, of the Accountable Care Act. I think the fallacy is so widespread because of the opposition to it. You think it would actually provide it. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> it was actually doing something. Right. Guaranteed yeah. health care and improved outcomes and that sort of thing, but um, it doesn't. And so a good example is there's the Institute of Medicine had a, the seminal uh, piece of work a few years ago called Unequal Treatment, yeah. which is really what, what we've been talking about where if you take an African-American, wealthy African-American who has wonderful health insurance, and, 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 and that person will get distinctly different health care in, in the same institution as a low-income, uneducated white person. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is nothing in the Accountable Care Act that is focused on impacting that disparity. And to me, that's perhaps a summary of what impact the Accountable Care Act will have in, in, in dealing with health disparities by improving uh, health equity. 
we have time for one more. Lucky me. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to just come back for a minute to the, to the question of rights and, and ask you all, I mean, when Dr. Goldhagen had said kind of several times, we can confer rights, and I guess I want to challenge that and ask, in the US, are we actually successful at conferring rights because the vast majority of the examples that you gave are, are civil and political rights. So the answer to children's rights is different than the answer to gay rights because gay rights is a civil and political question, not a substantive socioeconomic rights question. And I wonder, I mean, when, when we think about the kind of post-war building of the welfare state, we were thinking about the kind of rise and, and the power of labor to hold government accountable to agree to a key set of rights. And if we look now to countries in the global south, we see um, a constitutional right built in often. And you see, as we speak, women in Uganda going to the constitutional court to challenge and try to overturn the entire budget of the country based on the failure to deliver on the socioeconomic rights that you all are talking about. But they're able to do that because of the constitutional right. And so if we neither have the kind of labor power that's able to extract rights from the state, nor do we have a constitutional right, if we understand rights to be demands and claims on the state, isn't part of the problem that we don't have a mechanism to make claims on the state and instead we have the Affordable Care Act that does not? Right, <laughs> right. which is one of the limitations of rights. I, so when I made my comment about rights being inadequate, it's not that I don't think it's important to have rights. It's that in the US, especially if you look at the US Supreme Court's interpretation of rights, which completely eliminates any form of social rights but even if you look at the rights that do exist you know you take the the right to take the right to an abortion the US Supreme Court has made it clear that does not equal the right to claim any funding whatsoever for it it does it it now means that you just have the right if you can get over every burden that the state puts in your way to get one uh, you if you have any money left and there's a, a provider in your state, you know, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you could get through the fetal imaging and all of that, every, you know, th it's okay, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, even if, even if the state's law Im harms your health, women's health, it's okay, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. So even that right that, that we have, that the U.S. Supreme Court said exists in the U.S. Constitution, it's so puny. Uh, there, there are many, many women. It means nothing for them. So, um, it, it. I think you're right. It, the interpretation is so small. So then, what do we do about that? You know, as as we've been talking, I've been thinking about the movement of women of color reproductive justice advocates who've said the idea of reproductive choice is meaningless for many, many women, especially poor women and women of color. We need a concept of reproductive justice, which actually has many of the ideas that we've all been talking about, that looks at the, the context in which women exercise decisions about their health and the institutional ways uh, and hierarchies of power that, that prevent many women from being able to make these decisions that are supposedly protected by the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and how it has to be part, the idea of reproductive freedom must be part of a bigger struggle for social justice. You cannot separate them, which I, I you know, when you talked about holistic, it has to be holistic. It doesn't make sense to just talk about choice uh, to make a particular decision. It has to be part of a more egalitarian society, including, you know, the right to be able to raise children who have good nutrition. Yeah. You know, that's part of it as well. But um, it is a, a real problem because, yeah, human rights is a wonderful thing. The, U, the Supreme Court of the United States does not recognize human rights, you know. In fact, you know, Scalia thinks it's horrifying for the U.S. to ever refer to some foreign court uh, that, uh, that does recognize that there is such a thing as human rights recognized by, you know, the global community, uh, but another form of U.S. exceptionalism. Can I, can I just comment, because the, the, there's a tension um, and it's a tension uh, we hear all the time related to children's rights and the environment I work in, because we're the only country in the world that hasn't ratified the Convention mm -hmm. on the right. Rights of the mm -hmm. Child. 
the only one. And so, uh, which is extremely important, and I would be the last person to argue against ratification. But, and here's the but, human rights and the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Articles and so on can be used as a tool for realizing outcomes. It's not just right. the, le it's not just right. its legal force, um, it's mm -hmm. being able to use the principles of, of human rights, social justice, and equity, um, and other, and other, as tools to actually accomplishing what we want to accomplish. So I don't, you know, mm -hmm. so there are lots of countries that have ratified, all, all of them except us, um, that aren't realizing outcomes that we would say would be inherent in fulfilling the rights of children, right? So just having a legal document, just conferring it, uh, doesn't mean you can realize it. But the real power of these principles are their ability to be able to be translated into tools to move from principles to practice. And that's, I think, the, the evolutionary state we're in right now. How do we use these principles as tools to translate, to be translated actually into, into practice? Excellent. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Some rumbling tummies out there. So please find your way out of the lobby. Pick up your cards. Have something to eat and drink.